Kuro starts his first day of junior year, but he finds himself seated next to Mei, the infamous Jirai girl of his school. Her deep-set eye bags, sharp red eyes, porcelain white skin, and bright red lips. These are all traits that scream Jirai. Kuro has only ever heard rumors about her, and in contrast, he refers to himself as bland and unstylish. He's never had a non-school-related conversation last more than three seconds with a woman. Despite May's beauty winning her many admirers in school, her reputation and the nasty rumors surrounding her keep everyone at arm's length. Kuro glances at May and finds her staring right back at him, and she continues staring at him. A lot. May's gaze is deadly, and Kuro can soon feel physical pain from it. He wonders if it is because he was staring at her for too long too, so he tries to salvage the situation by apologizing. However, he finds May's entire body facing his direction, and he freezes like a deer in headlights. He manages to grow a spine and steady himself, and he tries apologizing again. A moment later, May is gazing deep into his eyes, and this time, her body is mere centimeters away. Kuro instinctively looks away from her eyes, and he ends up staring at her chest. He suffers a miniature panic attack. His mind races for answers or any explanation for why May is acting this way toward him. He recalls the rumors that May is a dangerous individual, and he fears that he's been caught in her spider's web. Bro, I will literally make snow angels in that web if given the chance. Kuro glances at her again, and he tries talking to her. Before he can finish, May pulls him closer and whispers into his ear that she'd like to see his textbook. He politely hands her the book without a fuss, though he tells her that she was a little too close for comfort. Kuro's back is sweating from stress, but he starts second-guessing the rumors surrounding May being dangerous. She gives him a return gift in the form of a Japanese history textbook, but he doesn't understand why. The teacher announces that they'll be doing trigonometric functions today, and he asks Kuro to answer the question on the board. He replies that he doesn't know the answer, only that the Edo period ended in 1868. Kuro and a few girls catch Mei staring eerily at her wrist, further exacerbating the rumors of her being a dangerous girl. Though Kuro is more understanding of Mei, he acknowledges that she does give off that I can fix her vibe. Later, after class, Mei hmm. confronts Kuro and holds a long, long piece of gum in front of his face. Kuro isn't really sure what her aim is here, and he asks if it's for him. She goes silent for a moment, opens the packaging, and eats it herself. As if she were just teaching him how to eat gum, she hands him the other half. Kuro is still rather confused about the whole situation, but there's one thing he does know. If he takes a bite, then he'll be having an indirect kiss with Mei. There are a lot of things going through his mind that scream that this is a bad idea, but he's so happy to have an indirect kiss that he ignores every single red flag. Happily deciding that he shouldn't overthink this, he happily accepts the gum. While chewing it, he recounts a brand of gum he would often eat as a child, and the flavor was so distinct that it was nostalgic for him. May suddenly laughs like a witch stirring a cauldron. She lets him have the rest of the gum, and she waves goodbye. Kuro also says see you tomorrow, and though May might be a bit odd, he undoubtedly finds her interesting, to say the least. Later, May takes out a marker and rolls down her sleeve. On her wrist is a wish list for how to spend her new semester, and next to the sentence, get along with the boy next to me, she draws a flower. Mm. Kuro's sudden acquaintanceship with May has breathed new life into his sophomore year. He generally feels afraid of flashy people or those in popular friend groups, mostly because he thinks that they hate him for no reason. When he exits the men's room, May is there waiting for him, suggesting that they walk home together. Kuro is stunned for a few moments, since he unfortunately doesn't have a rock-steady mantle equipped. When he finally realizes that she's not joking, he asks her again if she's sure she wants to go with him. Kuro panics, and his first instinct is to ask, why? He suddenly feels like she's overstepped some boundaries, so she stands up and awkwardly walks away. Kuro grabs her bag and asks how she commutes home. When she replies that she takes the train, Kuro says that he does the same, and he suggests that they go to the station together. May is delighted for a moment, then incredibly relieved the next. After regaining her composure, she says, let's go. Later, Kuro notices May staring at the bike rack in front of their school. When he learns that she can't ride a bike, he enthusiastically exclaims, me too, which May finds amusing. She has to hold back an outburst of laughter, while Kuro tries to point out that she can't ride a bike either. On the way to the station, the air is silent, and Kuro realizes that they don't have anything to talk about, since it feels terribly awkward, he tries to strike up a conversation, only to see Mei with an angry glare on her face, muttering the letter N. I wonder what she could be thinking. Kuro is suddenly terrified of her, and he fears that he has made some sort of terrible mistake, so terrible that he could almost wet himself. However, Mei suddenly speaks up, points across the street, and spots a fat cat's butt. Kuro, puzzled, looks across the street, 
but all he sees are a confectionery store's giant manju display pieces. Mei firmly believes it's two cats piling on top of each other, prompting Kuro to ask if her eyes are on right. She has colored contacts on, but they are non-prescription. Kuro hands her a pair of his reading glasses, pointing out that what she sees aren't cats. Mei quickly puts them on, and she is sorely disappointed that she wasn't looking at two jumbo cats on top of each other. She returns the glasses to him, but she's so embarrassed by what just happened that she starts steaming. Kuro tries to make her feel better by claiming that he had trouble seeing it at first, but she simply asks him to forget this ever happened. Kuro thinks that this was kind of cute. He asks her if she likes cats, and she tells him to shut his mouth. When they arrive at the station, they go their separate ways, since they take different train routes home. Before he leaves, Mei retreats her marker and asks him to take out his arm. She scribbles the words love cat underscore Mei on his arm, which she says is her line ID. She explains that she also wants to talk to him outside of school, and after doing this, she waves goodbye. Kuro's commute home is mostly him trying to process what just happened. It isn't until he arrives home that he realizes that he just got Mei's contact info. Mei's friend, and seemingly her only one, Chinatsu, suddenly <laughs> surprises her from behind. She cheekily starts painting on Mei's nails, and she tries her best not to move despite being incredibly ticklish. Chinatsu brags about how much her boyfriend dotes on her and how she had almost given up hope on dating altogether. She also loves Mei because she always listens to her. Mei is currently bleeding because she bit her cheek to try to soothe an itch. After Chinatsu finishes painting Mei's nails, she takes a photo of it so she can send it to her boyfriend. She brags that her boyfriend reads her messages so quickly, and she wants to prove it. After sending him the photo, she counts 7 seconds before she receives the much-awaited read notification. However, Mei finds it odd that Chinatsu did this, and she asks why she sent a seemingly mundane message. Chinatsu explains that it just makes sense to want to update the other person about what they're doing at the moment, and Mei asks if this will make you closer with the other person. Chinatsu thinks about it for a moment and replies that it will. When she learns that Mei has someone she wants to become closer with, she offers to pick out some nice clothes for her, put on her makeup, and keep painting her nails. Mei feels greatly reassured. That evening, Kuro puts on Netflix before bed. He receives a message from Mei, showing him that she had udon for dinner. Kuro replies that he had fried mackerel, and she sends back a sticker of a happy cat. He feels like this went well. Mei, on the other hand, is amazed by how easy it was to talk to someone. On the way to school, Kuro overhears some male students talking about Mei's strange appearance and demeanor. She's high up on the hot scale, but also on the crazed scale. Kuro won't deny that she gives off this impression, but he decides to try and clear the air. He approaches the two friends, claims that Mei isn't as bad as they might think, and walks away. Nameless students A and B are left confused, since all they were really talking about was how strange it was watching Mei practicing how to fall from her bike repeatedly. Later, the two friends approach Kuro and ask him about the nature of his relationship with Mei. They find it strange that Kuro, who never speaks unless spoken to, is suddenly standing up for her. They accuse him of doing a little something something behind the scenes because, let's face it, who wouldn't want to do a little something something? Kuro feels it might be incriminating to tell them that they go home together, so he tells them about how she gave him a long gum. Unfortunately, they misinterpret this to mean that she gave him a sword, which only adds to their confusion. They remark that Kuro, a shy introvert, and Mei, the scary Jirai girl, aren't a good match at all. Kuro tries to save her reputation, and instead of saying something like, she acts just like a normal girl, he worsens it by saying that she likes butts. To make things worse, he recounts that she wrote on his body with a marker, which lead the two students to believe that something much more sinister is going on. There's no end to the number of misunderstandings that their brains just blue screen. Kuro notices that they've gone silent, and they accept that they're better off just not talking to him about it. Kuro is terrible at telling stories. Later, Kuro realizes that he hasn't given Mei anything back for the gum. He visits the room next door, where Mei often hangs out between classes. Chinatsu notices him and asks if he's looking for someone, and he asks where Mei is. After telling him Mei is currently at the infirmary, he leaves, but she wonders who he is. Meanwhile, Mei is resting after her little biking incident. Kuro is treated at the infirmary for various injuries he sustained during the morning. The nurse reassures him that, despite the serious amount of blood that he lost, the wounds were thankfully shallow, but since it was a head wound, he should head to the hospital if he suddenly feels worse. Earlier, Kuro bumped into a judo club member, causing him to be flung into a window, shattering the glass. The judo member was apologetic enough to bring him to the infirmary and express remorse for the accident. For now, the nurse encourages Kuro to rest a while longer before going back to class. Kuro kind of wants to go to class, since the next one is math 
but unbeknownst to him, Mei is in the adjacent bed, separated by a curtain. Kuro can sense the presence of someone else in the room with him, but he decides that it was just his imagination. Suddenly, Mei appears behind him and asks how he got injured. Kuro nearly has a heart attack. After recovering from his second near-death experience today, he explains that he just lost a lot of blood in the head, so it wasn't that big of a deal. She asks if it hurts when he touches it, and she lifts her hand to caress and comfort his injury. He bashfully pushes her away and asks if she is also feeling unwell, not knowing that she's only here because a cat scratched her. The nurse returns after giving his infirmary card to the teacher, but she finds the room strangely empty. Mei has taken Kuro and hidden him in her bed section for reasons unknown. The nurse is called away by another teacher, leaving Mei and Kuro safe and sound. She complains that her head hurts, so Kuro playfully taps it, only for her to yelp out in pain. She prepares to finger flick him back in revenge, so Kuro closes his eyes and braces himself for it. Instead, Mei grabs his shoulders and pushes him onto the bed. This is it. They're going to do it. To my great disappointment, Mei returns to her side of the room and wishes him a good night. Kuro is happy that she was worried for him, but because her scent still lingers on the bedsheets, he struggles to get any sleep. Mei performs her morning school routine, brushing her teeth, fixing her hair, and buttoning up her shirt. Just like that, she's off to school. During her morning commute, her unique appearance attracts the attention of men and women alike. She wonders why more people are staring at her than usual, and when she looks down, she sees the reason. She put on her stylish shoes, not her regular loafers. She considers going home, but she'd be late for school. Thanks to an imaginary Chinatsu encouraging her that it doesn't matter, she decides to wing it and hope for the best. When she arrives at school, her teacher calls her attention, and Mei prepares to receive the scolding of her life. Fortunately for her, the teacher is a new hire, and she is unaware of Mei's reputation. She decides that there must be some subtle reason Mei is wearing these shoes, and she allows it. Mei's streak of bad luck doesn't end. During gym period, she discovers that she packed the wrong jersey for class. Imaginary Chinatsu returns, encouraging her to put it on, and to simply get through this with sheer confidence. Unfortunately for her, it doesn't work as well as it did this morning, and she is forced to write an apology letter due the following day. She receives another disheartening text from her father. She had left her bento box at home. She digs into her pockets for money, but she only finds 30 yen, which is only enough to get her three candy sticks. This further fuels the rumors surrounding her, but she couldn't care less. She's still starving Danit. Kuro notices her only having candy for lunch, and he worries that it won't be enough for her. He offers her some onigiri that his mother made using leftover fried rice, and Mei is all too happy to accept his generosity. As Kuro watches Mei happily eat the onigiri, he can't help but notice how cool her shoes look. Now here's a question for you, say you're alone on the first day of school, and someone next to you chats you up. They seem nice, but you quickly realize that they're friendly to everyone. This is the you're my only friend, but I'm not your only friend phenomenon. During English class, the teacher tells everyone to pair up for an activity. Mei instinctively turns to Kuro, but she sees him already talking to his friends. Her worldview is shattered, destroyed, and reduced to atoms. She starts exuding an aura that could kill you if you touched it. But Kuro surprisingly asks if he can pair up with her. He explains that he only received the worksheet from his friends, but they had already paired up with each other. Mei is relieved to be able to pair up with him. A few days later, Kuro is on an errand to purchase a cake for his little sister's birthday. While strolling around, he notices Mei outside of school. He instinctively backs away, worried about how he should approach her. He ultimately decides that she must be waiting for someone else. So he heads off to do his errands. Mei sees him and wants to call out to him, but a photographer stops her and asks her if he could take a few photos. A few minutes later, Kuro returns from the bakery and he spots Mei again. He tries approaching her this time but he suddenly has to deal with a lost child, crying for her mother. Mei sees Kuro assisting the little girl, and though she wants to help too, her scary eyes often make kids cry, so she'd just be making the situation worse. While Kuro comforts the girl, Mei returns wearing a magical girl mask, which comforts the lost child. Kuro recognizes that the girl is Mei, who manages to navigate the lost child's feelings and anxieties. They are able to take her to the local police station, where they eventually reunite the girl with her mother. Hiro thanks Mei for intervening, though he laments that he wasn't much help himself. Mei removes her mask and places it on him, reassuring him that he was dependable. They are finally together, and Kuro asks her how her day was. She replies that she went to a cat cafe. During one lunch period, Kuro is surprised to see that Mei isn't leaving, a sudden break from her usual routine. Chinatsu is currently absent today, so Mei is currently alone. They take out their lunch boxes at the same time, and their eyes inevitably meet. 
Kuro works up the courage and asks Mei out to eat on the roof. He's worried that she felt forced into it, but she mentions how nice the weather is. Kuro admits to her that he has trouble making friends, so he expresses his gratitude to her for taking the first step in talking to him before. Mei is unimaginably happy to hear this, so happy that she drops her chopsticks, but the lack of utensils only stops lesser men, as Mei decides to eat her lunch with her bare hands. Kuro offers to let her use his chopsticks, remarking that she can simply return it to him when she finishes. Instead, Mei suggests that they take turns using the chopsticks and eating together. Once again, this is Kuro's long-awaited indirect kiss event. Kuro starts overthinking this way too much, and when he realizes that Mei likely wouldn't care about something like an indirect kiss, he decides to go with the flow. Mei suddenly grabs one of the Kuro's tamagoyaki, leaving him very confused. Mei's plan was originally to have this become a playful back and forth of them eating from each other's bento, but a single pair of chopsticks makes it impossible. To salvage the situation, she takes a piece from her own bento and offers to feed it to him. Mei finds the flavor of his tamagoyaki to taste strange, and he explains that his mother places sugar, milk, and mayonnaise in hers. Mei doesn't know how hers is cooked, though it is most likely dashi tamagoyaki. Thank you, scan later group. Mei says that when in a good mood her father makes omu rice for her bento. Kuro is a bit jealous of this, so Mei offers to let him eat some at her house. The sudden and unplanned invitation catches them both off guard. Kuro's mind goes into full overdrive to try and process this. Unfortunately, his brain doesn't have enough RAM, and he blurts out that he doesn't want to, even though he really wants to. Kuro messed up big time. Later, Mei sulks alone at her father's cafe, musing over the amorous she wanted to eat. Chinatsu suddenly comes into Mei's room bright and early at 7 am to play or rather to use Mei as a human doll. They often meet up like this so that Chinatsu can dress Mei up in various outfits and makeup. After Chinatsu doses Mei with a healthy serving of an energy drink at this godforsaken hour, she gets up to prepare. A few minutes later, a special exfoliating mask is applied to Mei's face. However, Chinatsu isn't quite sure what to do to Mei first. She flips through a few fashion magazines, of which Mei selects the more intense one. Chinatsu agrees, and unfortunately, nobody is around to tell them it's a bad idea. She rummages through her belongings and selects a few choice accessories, then she has Mei remove her mask. Chinatsu heats up the curling iron, thus beginning their intense, no-holds-barred, hell in a cell makeup session. By the time Chinatsu has finished, Mei has been transformed into a porcelain doll. Chinatsu repeats this several times, with each one looking more outlandish than the last. In at least one instance, Mei becomes a zombie and a vampire. The pair drop to the floor, exhausted but satisfied. Chinatsu wants to do this again, but Mei would prefer to do it at a more reasonable hour and not at some ungodly time like 7 in the morning. She later sends the photo to Kuro, who may or may not have set it as his wallpaper. As usual, Mei is the talk of the town. After one girl brushed arms with her and felt her low body temperature, they believe that she has always been this way. Kuro is cold too, but in a different way. The window next to him has been letting in a cold draft, and he is bearing the full brunt of it. He regrets not bringing a sweater or a jacket, but fortunately for him, Mei seems to have noticed that he is cold, and she politely shuts the window. When the bell rings, signaling the end of the period, Mei suddenly touches Kuro's cheeks. Up there, not down there. She finds his face to be quite warm, so she prolongs touching it, but this is easily misconstrued as the build-up to a kiss. On that note, they should just kiss already. Mei finally lets go and mentions that he seemed cold, so she offers to give him a blanket that she brought. Kuro is a bit shy and hesitant to receive her kindness, but she insists that he does, lest he catch a cold. By the time the next period starts, the teacher notices that Kuro looks cute today. Meanwhile, Mei is very satisfied that her cat print blanket is of use. After another tiring week, Kuro prepares to go home, but he is startled to see that Mei has been waiting for him the entire time. She usually goes home with Chenatsu, but recently, she seems to be waiting on him. He doesn't mind being her plan B, but she finds it strange that she chose him as her backup plan. Mei suddenly places her hands on his stomach to check if he is hungry, so she invites him out to eat. Kuro roughly expected to be brought to a chick cafe or a milk tea store, but he is rather surprised that Mei brought him to a Lawson's instead. As it turns out, she only has a hundred yen coin on her. She usually picks out a snack from the shelves, but since Kuro is with her today, she's going to get something special. Convenience store chicken. She boasts that the chicken is super crunchy and crispy, and she has always wanted to share it with a friend since she usually doesn't eat meat on her own. She devours it in no time at all, but Kuro seems like he's already full just watching her eat. 
She asks him if he has any napkins, so he digs around in his bag for one. However, it seems like May wants him to wipe her mouth for her. He isn't sure what to make of this, but he decides to do as he's told anyway. She tells him that he can go a bit harder, and he can tell that she's enjoying this somewhat. She immediately takes another bite of the chicken, and Kuro points out that he could have just wiped her mouth when she finished eating. May hadn't really thought of that. Kuro searches for the latest release of a romance manga at a bookstore, only for May to suddenly pop up behind him. No, seriously, is she a wizard or something? He explains that he's buying the issue on behalf of his sister, and May shows that she's also here to buy volumes of what appears to be a history textbook. On the way home, May curiously asks what the manga is about, and Kuro explains that it's about an aspiring idol who uses her dedication, grit, love, and fists to make it to the top. May finds it interesting, but Kuro explains that it's aimed at children. However, after recalling memories of how May acts, he decides that she might actually like it. He allows her to borrow it for now, citing that his sister is probably too busy with schoolwork to read it anyway. May happily accepts the manga, and for once, the two are on the same page. They both believe that this is an important step toward becoming close friends. In exchange, May lends him the book she bought earlier. When Kuro arrives home, his little sister excitedly runs up to him, expecting to receive the magical idol manga she's been looking forward to all day. Imagine her surprise and devastation when she receives a boring textbook instead. When May returns home, she excitedly spins around with the manga, Submission Revolution Bare-Handed Fight Star Idol, which is exactly as fun as it sounds. When her father asks if he can read it, she bluntly says no. May's father asks her to bring something to their neighbor Matsu in exchange for some vegetables she gave them recently. He also tells May that Matsu recently got a cat, and suddenly, the errand doesn't seem so bad. On the way, May visits a pet store to purchase a few cat toys before going to the Matsus. When she arrives, she is fully equipped and prepared to play with the cat. May takes a seat and patiently waits for the cat. She hears a paw step on the tatami mat, and she turns around. Even the cat is a bit afraid of May, but she manages to persuade it to stay by throwing a small toy. Still, the cat remains frozen in place while May stares into its eyes. She gets a bright idea, and she zips down her jacket. When Ms. Matsu returns, she sees that May has stuffed the cat into her jacket. May finds it to be very cute, so Ms. Matsu asks her if she has any name ideas, since she has yet to name the cat. May stares into the cat's eyes again and thinks about it for a moment. The next day, May hums a tune while walking to her desk, and Kuro can tell she's in a good mood. She shows him a photo of the cat, which she revealed she had named Kuro. Kuro can see that this cat isn't black, and he asks her why. A male student announces that he's got the goods, and Shinatsu comments that May's class seems quite lively. May wonders what they're doing, and Shinatsu suggests that they might be doing that Russian cream trend lately, which entails getting a cream puff and adding in mustard, wasabi, Tabasco sauce, and other spicy ingredients. Shinatsu prefers to actually enjoy her cream puffs, but if she were to join the bandwagon, she wouldn't mind if her crush happened to eat them. That's just messed up, I think. Shinatsu returns to her class, leaving May to think about joining the Russian cream trend. She'd like to try it, but she doesn't want her mouth to hurt. Some of the students pressure Kuro into joining their Russian cream, mostly because they want to see him make a face they don't usually see. Kuro surprisingly agrees to do it. He reaches out to grab one of the pieces, but May suddenly steps up, grabs his arm, and takes one of the cream puffs herself first. Everyone braces themselves in case she explodes. She opens her mouth, eats it, and swallows it, with seemingly no adverse effects, Kuro picks up and eats the tainted cream puff, but he doesn't react in any way. He explains that he felt like nobody would want to eat the cream puff, so he wanted to eat it so that it wouldn't go to waste. The entire class starts apologizing for trying to trick him. However, Mei leans in to make sure Kuro is okay, causing their classmates to think that they're about to kiss. Kuro reassures her that he's fine, though he notices that there's a bit of sauce on her hand. She scrunches up her face and experiences the phlegm in response, something that only animals can do. Kuro spends his day off by heading into the city instead of playing League of Legends. He notices a Chinese restaurant that he hasn't visited yet, so he decides to try it out. Though the restaurant was empty at first, it gradually filled up with more and more people. He notices a group of flashy-looking guys talking to each other, and he can't help but eavesdrop on them. After ordering some super spicy mapo tofu, he plans to go home right after eating it. However, he notices someone familiar walking through the doors, May. The group immediately welcomes her in, and she is ushered inside. Kuro observes as they gather around her and snap photos. They watch with bated breath as she orders a single serving of gyoza, and the entire group erupts into cheers and applause. Kuro has seen strange things, but nothing quite as strange as this. 
he continues observing Mei to satisfy his curiosity, and he watches as she slowly eats her plate of gyoza. The room falls silent, and when she finishes, they ask her for her opinion on the dish, and Mei gives a long-winded explanation that can be boiled down to gyoza was good. I'm not reading all that. One of them asks how she recommends eating it, so she gives her personal preference on how to enjoy it. Again, I'm not reading all that. What matters to Kiro is that Mei is actually talking. He overhears one of them refer to Mei as Gyoza Paku Paku, and Kuro concludes that this is some sort of Gyoza fan club, and Mei serves as their charismatic icon. This is the first time that Kuro has heard of something like this, and he observes that she's quite used to all the attention. He feels slightly honored that he might be the only one who sees Mei like this. The next day, he asks Mei what her favorite food is, and she replies, without missing a beat, Nihachi Soba. The teacher reminds the class that they'll be having a three-day weekend, and Kuro intends to spend them all playing games and sleeping. However, for once, he considers going out like a normal high schooler. He considers inviting Mei to hang out, but he quickly dissuades himself from doing so. A few minutes earlier, Mei approached Chinatsu for advice on how to ask a friend to hang out. Chinatsu doesn't really understand what the fuss is all about, but she realizes that Mei wants to ask out somebody who isn't a girl. Kuro's face pops up in her head which means that Mei can't risk being rejected. There are actual lives at stake here. Chinatsu won't let her friend down, and she offers her full support to help her out. Back in the present, Mei sends Kuro a text, asking him to wait for her at the station. She practically teleports across the room, causing Kuro to wonder what she's up to. Later, Kuro waits at the station, just as he was told. He finds himself following Mei's orders quite often recently, and he reminds himself to be just a little bit cautious. Mei finally arrives with a remarkably different hairstyle from before. Before anything else, Kuro compliments her hair. He allows her to finish whatever business she had here, though he muses that talking with her feels like a surreal experience. He isn't sure of the reason that Mei suddenly changed her hairstyle for him, and she even invited him, albeit in a roundabout way, to meet up at the station. He recalls their first interaction, way back in Chapter 1, and he's glad that it led to their relationship today. He doesn't mind their relationship being one huge misunderstanding either though. Mei starts poking his cheek to get his attention, and she says that she'd like to spend more time with him, even on days when they don't have school. She asks him if he's free this weekend, which initiates Kuro's Windows XP-powered brain. The sudden invitation nearly causes him to freeze, and he can't quite believe it's real. During the weekend, Kuro nervously shows up for his hangout with Mei. He doesn't know if this is a date, but he does know that it doesn't seem real. He tries to calm himself down by pretending that five men are running up to him to tell him that this was all a prank. However, Mei shows up, showing that this is indeed real life. Kuro is a bit anxious and nervous to walk next to someone who dresses up this nicely. Kuro has an inkling that Mei hasn't actually planned anything, and he is right on the money. For now, Kuro suggests that they walk around. Unfortunately, the one place Mei wanted to go to, the Cat Cafe, is closed. Next, they visit the local cinema, but the only seats available are rows apart. They try hitting a restaurant or a cafe, but they are also unbelievably full. This is the weekend after all. Mei suddenly trips and steadies herself using Kuro, as her shoe sole became loose while they were walking. They go to a nearby park so that they can take a breather. He leads her for a while, but Mei becomes depressed. When Kuro returns, Mei is nowhere to be found, and only her shoes can be seen. He suspects that she's inside the slide, and he knocks on it. Mei apologizes for today, because even though she invited him out, she hadn't made any plans. He reassures her that he's just happy to be able to spend time with her, so he asks her to come out. Mei slides down, and Kuro brings out a small pair of cat-themed sandals. He says that they were inexpensive, so she can feel free to throw them out as she wishes. Mei smiles, and it seems like she'll keep them. Her mood improves, and when she stands up, she realizes that it was one of those health sandals, with the humps and bumps inside. 